Okay, here we are back again with more Dragon Age Origins, and uh, wow, we have four emissaries in our camp now. That's amazing, and Ogren, who's standing in the way. But yes, we have four emissaries. It's amazing because we finished all the four main quests that we needed to do. We went to Redcliffe, we went to the Circle Tower, we went to Orzammar, we went to the Brazilian Forest. And so, um, pretty much the next main quest we have is to go to back to Arleman and Redcliffe and prepare to head to the Landsmeet and get started with the Landsmeet, which will sort of be the beginning of the third act of the game. But I'm not going to do that just yet, because that would... Because there's some other stuff we can do first. Um, like read Codex. Yay! Codex! Oh my gosh, we have so much Codex to go through. So we're definitely going to do Codex this episode. <clears throat> Here's one on the Hala, which is the deer creatures that the, the elves uh, work with, live with. No creature is more revered by the Dalish than the Hala. No other animal has a god of its own. These white stags are much larger than ordinary deer, and the, and the Dalish Hala keepers carve an their antlers as they grow, making them curve into intricate designs. In ancient times, these stags bore elven knights into combat, but since the fall of the Dales, they are used less as mounts and more to pull the Arabels. So that's cool. Used to be war steeds. Uh, here's one on the wild sylvan, uh, which is all the those trees that we were killing in the forest. <laughs> For demons crossing over into our world, mankind is not always the preferred prey. Possessing humans means risking encounters with powerful mages and templars, as well as other complications. Some demons find it far easier to seek out animals or even plants, assuming that these will make as suitable a host as a human. Those that possess trees are known as wild sylvans. Generally, only demons of rage, the weakest of the demon hierarchy, will become a sylvan. Once they do, they must spend a great deal of time twisting and molding the host in order to make it mobile. And once they have the sylvan, once they have, the sylvan is a powerful and deadly opponent. Other, more intelligent spirits have also been known to become sylvans and are generally much less violent, but these are rare. Slow, but immensely powerful, wild sylvans prefer to lay in ambush, waiting for a victim to become lost, tired, or trapped before closing in for the kill. They hide among regular trees, nearly undetectable until they begin to move and to reach. When they do come to life, as some travelers say, they stand tall, roots forming into legs and feet and branches stretching out into lashing arms. When not presented with a living target, however, it has been noted that sylvans often fall into a form of dormancy, perhaps brought on by the nature of their tree host. Well, while mobile, they normally return to wherever they were rooted once their prey has been killed. For, the, for both these reasons, a forest that has sylvans within can become incredibly dangerous to pass through for very long periods of time. And of course, uh, an entry on the werewolf. And Dane he stood his ground, the fanged beast approached. He saw the rage within its eyes, the wolf that once was there. The sword he raised, merciful death be praised, to the maker went his prayer. From the popular telling of Dane and the werewolf, a legend of Ferelden, circa 450 Black. Ferelden lore is full of instances when these cre where these creatures have plagued the countryside. Wolves possessed by rage demons and transformed into humanoid monsters with incredible speed and strength, able to spread a curse to those they bit that would drive them mad with unthinking fury. When in this enraged state, a human host can likewise become possessed and be transformed into a feral, wolf-like beast. Tales differ on these werewolves of human origin, some claiming that their transformation into a into a bestial form happens uncontrollably. Some claim the transformation is irreversible. As is often the case with demonic tales, both versions were most likely true at some point. 
The ability of normal dogs to detect a werewolf, even when it is in a human guise, is what first led Ferelden's to adopt dogs as indispensable companions in every farmhold. The alliance between humans and regular wolves is the subject of the popular Ferelden folktale, Dane and the Werewolf. The actual hero Dane led a crusade to eliminate the werewolf threat during the early Black Age, and while werewolves have never assumed the same prominence since, there have still been reports of individual packs lurking in remote forests. In recent years, some have even been reported to have developed an uncanny willpower and intelligence, though why this is so is still unknown. Okay, sorry about that little break in the action there. I had a dog come into the room and want my attention. Um, okay. Alright, the ancient elven armor. Before the fall of Arlathan, even before Arlathan itself, the civilization of the elves stretched across all of Thetis like a great, indolent cat. <laughs> That's an interesting visual metaphor. A great, indolent cat. This armor was made for temple guards in a time when the creators still spoke to the elves. The techniques of its forging, even the name of the metal it is forged from, have long since faded from memory. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, alright. So... I think I actually have done Andruil. Let's look at Dirthamon, Keeper of Secrets. The twins Falandin and Dirthamen are the eldest children of Elgernon, the Allfather, and Mithal, the Protector. The brothers were inseparable from the moment of their conception, known for their great love for each other. That is why we often speak of Falandin in one breath and Dirthamen in the next, for they cannot bear to be apart, not even in our tales. When the world was young, the gods often walked the earth, and Falondin and Dirthamen were no exception. Both were delighted by the many wonders of our earth. They played with the animals, whispered to the trees, and bathed in the lakes and streams. Their days were filled with bliss, and they did not know sorrow. And then one day, while passing through the forest, Falondin and Dirthamen came across an old and sickly deer resting beneath a tree. "'Why do you sit so still, little sister?' asked Falondin. "'Play with us,' said Dirthamen. "'Alas,' spoke the deer, "'I cannot. I am old, and although I wish to go to my rest, my legs can no longer carry me.' Taking pity on the deer, Falandin gathered her up into his arms and carried her to her rest beyond the veil. Dirthamen tried to follow them, but the shifting grey paths beyond the veil would not let him. Separated for the first time from Falandin, Dirthamen wandered aimlessly till he came across two ravens. "'You are lost, and soon you will fade,' the raven named Fear said to Dirthamon. "'Your brother has abandoned you. He no longer loves you,' said the other, named Deceit. "'I am not lost, and Falandin has not abandoned me,' replied Dirthamon. He subdued the ravens and bade them carry him to Falandin. This they did, for they had been defeated and were now bound to Dirthamon's service. When Dirthamon found Falandin, he found also the deer, who once again was light on her feet, for her spirit was released from her weakened body. Both Falandin and Dirthamon rejoiced to see this. Falandin vowed that he would remain to carry all the dead to their place beyond, just as he did the deer, and Dirthamon stayed with him, for the twins cannot bear to be apart. From the story of Falandin and Dirthamon, as told by Gisharel, keeper of the Ralafarin clan of the Dalish elves. Elgernon, god of vengeance. Long ago, when time itself was young, the only things in existence were the sun and the land. The sun, curious about the land, bowed his head close to her body, and Elgernon was born in the place where they touched. The sun and the land loved Elgernon greatly, for he was beautiful and clever. As a gift to Elgernon, the land brought forth great birds and beasts of sky and forest, and all manner of wonderful green things. Elgernon loved his mother's gifts and praised them highly and walked amongst them often. The sun, looking down upon the fruitful land, saw the joy that Elgernon took in her works and grew jealous. Out of spite, he shone his face full upon all the creatures the earth had created and burned them all to ashes. The land cracked and split from bitterness and pain, and cried salt tears for the loss of all she had wrought. The pool of tears cried for the land that cried for the land became the ocean, and the cracks in her body the first rivers and streams. 
Elgernon was furious at what his father had done and vowed vengeance. He lifted himself into the sky and wrestled the sun, determined to defeat him. They fought for an eternity, and eventually the sun grew weak, while er Elgernon's rage was unabated. Eventually, Elgernon threw the sun down from the sky and buried him in a deep abyss created by the land's sorrow. With the sun gone, the world was covered in shadow, and all that remained in the sky were the reminders of Elgernon's battle with his father, drops of the sun's lifeblood which twinkled and shimmered in the darkness. Interesting creation myth. Falandin, friend of the dead, the guide. O oh, Falandin, Lathanavir, friend to the dead, guide my feet, calm my soul, lead me to my rest. In ancient times, the people were ageless and eternal, and instead of dying, would enter Uthanera, the long sleep, and walk the shifting paths beyond the veil with Falandin and his brother Dirthamon. Those elders would learn the secrets of dreams, and some returned to the people with newfound knowledge. But we quickened and became mortal. Those of the people who passed walked with Falandin into the beyond, and never returned. If they took counsel with Dirthamon on their passage, his wisdom was lost, for it went with them into the beyond also, and never came to the people. Then Fenharel caused the gods to be shut away from us, and those who passed no longer had Falandin to guide them. And so we learned to lay our loved ones to rest with an oaken staff, to keep them from faltering along the paths, and a cedar branch to scatter the ravens named Fear and Deceit, who were once servants of Dirthamon, now without a master. It's kind of sad. Here's Fen Harel, the Dread Wolf. There is precious little we know about Fen Harel, for they say he did not care for our people. Elgernon and Mithal created the world as we know it. Andruil taught us the ways of the hunter. Selais and June gave us fire and crafting, but Fenharel kept to himself and plotted the betrayal of all the gods. And after the destruction of Arlathan, when the gods could no longer hear our prayers, it is said that Fenharel spent centuries in a far corner of the earth, giggling madly and hugging himself in glee. The legends say that before the fall of Arlathan, the gods we know and revere fought an endless war with others of their kind. There is not a Haren among us who remembers these others. Only in dreams do we hear whispered the names of Gelduarn and, Dernith and Dernthal and Anaris, for they are the forgotten ones, the gods of terror and malice, spite and pestilence. In ancient times, only Fenharel could walk without fear among both our gods and the Forgotten Ones, for although he is kin to the gods of the people, the Forgotten Ones knew of his cunning ways and saw him as one of their own. And that is how Fenharel tricked them. Our gods saw him as brother, and they trusted him when he said that they must keep to the heavens while he arranged a truce. And the Forgotten Ones trusted him also when he said he would arrange for the defeat of our gods if only the Forgotten Ones would return to the Abyss for a time. They trusted Fenharel, and they were all of them betrayed, and Fenharel sealed them away so they could never again walk among the people. <clears throat> so there's a lot, you know, obviously there's a lot of parallels you, you can see if you know anything about sort of... Uh, you know, real-life mytho mythologies. You can see a lot of parallels here between the Dalish myths and, you know, actual, like, myths that exist in the real world. <clears throat> Trickster gods are, uh, you know, <laughs> ubiquitous in, in sort of pre-Christian mythologies. Uh, Gilanine, mother of the Hala. They say Gilanine was one of the people in the days before Arlathan, and the chosen of Andruil the Huntress. She was very beautiful, with hair of snowy white, and as graceful as a gazelle. She kept way always to Andruil's ways, and Andruil favored her above all others. One day, while hunting in the forest, Gilanine came across a hunter she did not know. At his feet lay a hawk, shot through the heart by an arrow. Gilanine was filled with rage, for the hawk, along with the hare, is an animal much beloved of Andruil. Gilanine demanded that the hunter make an offering to Andruil in exchange for taking the life of one of her creatures. The hunter refused, and Gilanine called upon the goddess to curse him so that he could never again hunt and kill a living creature. 
Gilanine's curse took hold, and the hunter found that he was unable to hunt. His prey would dart out of sight, and his arrows would fly astray. His friends and family began to mock him for his impotence, for what use is a hunter who cannot hunt? Ashamed, the hunter swore he would find Gilanine and repay her for what she had done to him. He found Gilanine while she was out on a hunt with her sisters, and lured her away from them with lies and false words. He told Gilanine that he had learned his lesson and begged her to come with him so she could teach him to make a proper offering to Andrewil. Moved by his plea, Gilanine followed the hunter, and when they were away from all of her sisters, the hunter turned on Gilanine. He blinded her first, and then bound her as one he as one would bind a kill fresh from the hunt, but because he was cursed, the hunter could not kill her. Instead, he left her for dead in the forest. And Gilanine prayed to the gods for help. She prayed to Elgernon for vengeance, to Mother Mithal to protect her, but above all, she prayed to Andruil. Andruil sent her hairs to Gilanine, and they chewed through the ropes that bound her, but Gilanine was still wounded and blind, and could not find her way home. So Andruil turned her into a beautiful white deer, the first Hala, and Gilanine found her way back to her sisters and led them to the hunter, who was brought to justice. And since that day, the Hala have guided the people and have never led us astray, for they listen to the voice of Gilanine. And June, I, you know, there's no accent on there, so I don't pronounce it June. If there was an accent there, then I would, but there's no accent, so I'm going to assume it's just June god of the craft we dedicate all our crafts to june for it is he who taught the people to bend the branches of trees to make our bows and to fashion coverings of furs and iron bark without june would we have the aravel or the harnesses for our hollow when the people were young we wandered the forests without purpose we drank from streams and ate the berries and nuts that we could find we did not hunt, for we had no bows. We wore nothing, for we had no knowledge of spinning or needlecraft. We shivered in the cold nights, and went hungry through the winters, when all the world was covered in ice and snow. Then Silaes the hearthkeeper came, and gave us fire, and taught us how to feed it with wood. June taught us to fashion bows and arrows and knives, so that we could hunt. Uh, we learned to cook the flesh of the creatures we hunted over Silas's fire, and we learned to clothe ourselves in their furs and skins, and the people were no longer cold and hungry. So that's good. And now we come to Mithal, the great protector. Elgernon had defeated his father, the sun, and all was covered in darkness. Pleased with himself, Elgernon sought to console his mother, the earth, by replacing all that the sun had destroyed. But the earth knew that without the sun, nothing could grow. She whispered to Elgernon this truth, and pleaded with him to release his father, but Elgernon's pride was great, and his vengeance was terrible, and he refused. It was at this moment that Mithal walked out of the sea of the earth's tears and onto the land. She placed her hand on Elgernon's brow, and at her touch he grew calm and knew that his anger had led him astray. Humbled, Elgernon went to the place where the sun was buried and spoke to him. Elgernon said he would release the sun if the sun promised to be gentle and to return to the earth each night. The sun, feeling remorse at what he had done, agreed. And so the sun rose again in the sky and shone his golden light upon the earth. Elgernon and Mithal, with the help of the earth and the sun, brought back to life all the wondrous things that the sun had destroyed, and they grew and thrived. And that night, when the sun had gone to sleep, Mithal gathered the glowing earth around his bed and formed it into a sphere to be placed in the sky, a pale reflection of the sun's true glory. <clears throat> so yeah, lots of really interesting sort of um, origin myths. Uh, here we have a good one on Aravels. Um, the Dalish, who band together in small groups of blood relatives, travel in ornately carved wagons known as Aravel, drawn by large white stags called Hala. The Aravel are a unique sight, beautiful in their swooping curvature, and adorned with broad hoods and bright silken cloths that flap in the wind, often displaying the noble banners that once flew over that family's house. Most humans refer to the Aravel as land ships, for in a strong wind it can often appear as if the elves travel in long boats with sails high overhead to announce their arrival, or warn others away. 
The Hala are unique to the elves, and any but elven handlers consider them ornery and almost impossible to train. To the Dalish, they are noble beasts, superior in breeding to the horse. Certainly most humans would agree that the Hala are as beautiful as the elves themselves, the fact that many imperial nobles maintain a bounty on Hala horns that find their way into Tevinter is an affront that the Dalish consider unforgivable. Few among us can claim to have seen the Dalish landships up close. Any human who sees them on the horizon does well to head the other way. Few Dalish clans take kindly to humans intruding on their camps, and more than one tale tells of troublemaking humans who found themselves mercilessly filled with Dalish arrows. I mean, fair enough. They have good reason to be paranoid. The Long Walk. And this is one of the reasons why they're paranoid. When our people left to Vinter, we had nothing except the knowledge that for the first time in countless centuries, we were free. It was Chartan's dream that one day we would have our own homeland, where we could live as we chose. After the long struggle that claimed the lives of many, even Chartan himself, we were granted the Dales. And though the Dales were to the south of the land of Orlais, and a long way off from Tevinter, it mattered little. We were going home, and so we walked. We called our journey the Long Walk, for that was what it was. We walked with what little we had on our backs. Some walked without shoes, for they had none. Whole families, women with infants, the old and young alike, all of them made their way across the land on foot. And if one of our people could no longer walk, we carried him, or sometimes left him behind. Many perished along the way. Some died of exhaustion, others simply gave up and fell by the wayside. A great number were set upon by human bandits, even though we had few possessions. Along the way, a growing number began to, de to bemoan the decision to leave Tevinter. At least in Tevinter, they said, we had food and water and shelter. What do we have here? Nothing but the open sky and the prospect of the never-ending road ahead. Some turned back toward Tevinter, but most of us continued walking. And the gods rewarded those of us who did not waver by bringing us to the Dales. Our people called the new city Halam Shiral, the end of the journey, and for a time, it was home. Uh, here's one, Uthanera. To the ancient elves who existed during the time of Arlathan, Uthanera was an act of reverence. Elves did not age. They were not immortal, but they did not suffer from deterioration of mind or body. They suffered only from a deterioration of the spirit, which, you know, fair enough, if your body doesn't age, eventually, after a certain point, you're going to start to be kind of weary of life. It did not happen often, yeah, but the oldest of the elves were said to reach a point where they became weary of life. Memories became too much to bear, and rather than fade into complacency, they voluntarily stood aside to let newer generations guide their people. Uthanera means the long sleep, in which the elder would retire to a chamber that was one part bed and one part tomb. To great ceremony from all the extended family, the elder would succumb to a slumber from which they would not wake for centuries, and often never. In time... The body would deteriorate, and the elder would die in truth. All the while, family would continue to visit the chamber to pay respect to one who had made such a great sacrifice. With the arrival of humans and the quickening of elven blood that ensued, the practice of Uthanera began to fade. When Arlathan fell, it ceased forever. From What Has Passed by Hassandriel, Lord of Halamshiral, 2-7 Glory. Valislin, Blood Riding. When the children of our people come of age, they earn the privilege of wearing the Valislin, the blood riding. It sets us apart from the Shemlin and from the elves who have thrown their lot in with them. It reminds us that we will never again surrender our traditions and beliefs. The ritual deserves great reverence. The one who is to gain the Valislin must prepare by meditating on the gods and the ways of our people, and by purifying the body and the skin. When the time comes, the keeper of the clan applies the blood writing. This is done in complete silence. Cries of pain are signs of weakness. If one cannot tolerate the pain of the blood writing, they are not ready to undertake the responsibilities of an adult. 
The Keeper may stop the ritual if they decide that the one gaining the Valislin is not ready. There is no shame in this, for all children are different, and our ancestors once took centuries to come of age. So that's interesting. Um, their, you know, coming of age ritual. Um, I think we'll probably leave it here. I can probably do a little bit more Codex next time. As always, if you like what you see, please like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next episode. Later.